Hey there, my name is Aron Horvat. In this video, I will show you what steps I make when I'm starting a new project which incorporates sb.net web application, entity framework with SQL Server, and authentication. When initializing a project, I have a couple of goals I want to meet. First and foremost, I want a clear path to developing a domain model. I'm a backend developer. I design domain models all day long. And so I want to see where the domain will be developed. But it's not possible to just develop a domain model. We need everything around it. So the next goal is to have a clear path to developing a UI. Supposedly, the project will be a web application. And so we need a web app, sp.net web application, initialized right away. The next goal is about persistence. Suppose that there are no special needs for the new application that would preclude use of Entity Framework. So we might choose to use Entity Framework right away and maybe, maybe step away from it in certain parts of the project later. And a very important element of a new project is authentication and authorization. I don't want authorization added later because that opens the room for mistakes, for security loopholes, if you like. So these are the primary goals I want to satisfy in five minutes. And there is one overarching goal over all the activities I will show you. Least obligations on the outset of the project. We don't know how the project is going to evolve. If you know that certain parts of the domain will be services, the others not, how do you know that? Do you know the future? I bet you don't. What I do is not to make those decisions now. Because it is too early, I don't know the future. I will let the empty project evolve. And one note before we begin. If you expect me to start off designing a clean architecture project right away, then sorry, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because that is too much ceremony for me. Any project which is decoupling important elements from each other is clean. Any architecture that does that is clean. So you better start off with as little obligations as you can and then develop a clean architecture as you go. That is probably the most important advice you will hear in this video. So let's get on to it. I will show you how to use command line tools. As I will develop a script that initializes the empty project. Visual Studio is offering a GUI for all these steps so you can even use a GUI to complete this initialization. And also be advised that you can find the entire script in the description so you don't have to <laughs> write down what I, what I type on the screen. Just try to figure out why I'm doing all this and what are the benefits and what is the end result of these steps. So I will install the CLI tools first. Entity Framework tool. If you already have it installed and you probably do, then you can update it to the latest version. And the .NET SPNet code generator tool, we will use that one to add identity to the project. Install it or update it as well. So we are ready to start. First, the command to create an empty solution. You should provide the name for the solution here. And then initialize a new Razor Pages project from the template. This will generate the layout, a few pages so you can see where the pages are. You can edit them and substitute them and add more pages as you like when you start developing the UI. So the initial decision is to start off with the Razor project. Again, you can change this decision later for different parts of the project. This is not cast in stone. If you separate the UI from the domain and from persistence, then you can substitute only the UI retaining everything else. That is what makes this project clean on the outset. Now we step to adding the dependencies. We need Entity Framework and we need Identity. So the free packages for the Entity Framework, here they come. Design time components for the EF core, then the SQL Server provider for Entity Framework, and the tools for EF Core that you will use in Package Manager if you use Visual Studio. These are the three mandatory dependencies for the Entity Framework. Now we step to supplying identity. The Code Generator tool, 
then Identity Implementation on Entity Framework Core, and the Identity Razor pages that we will include in the project. We are ready to generate the identity pages, so we use the sp.net code generator. Again, Visual Studio has a GUI for this, you can tick the checkboxes and select what you want to, to be generated for you. Anyway, here is the implementation. There you have the identity data and the pages, UI pages. But before adding the migration, there is one mandatory step I always make. Go to the DB context that was generated for the identity and on model creating, include the schema name here. I don't know why identity is generated to be added to the root schema. I never add anything to the root schema. Every part of the project must have a database schema of its own. A schema like authentication would be just fine. Now we can add the migration, but before that, let me add one more step which I always make. I pay a visit to the, the application builder. This is a very practical change. I want to see authentication and authorization at work right away. So what I do is just for a test to authorize the index page that will force me to register the first time I start this application. This is just a practical trick. I would remove, probably remove this authorization very soon, but I want to see authorization at work. Now we get back to the script where we create the migration for the identity, update the database, and here it is. The next step is to start the application for the first time. This is an empty application, but it has some UI, it has authorization and authentication, and it is ready to start accepting domain models and even persisting it using Entity Framework Core. Here is the index. Yes, it is authorized, so I have to register first. Now, th this requires complicated passwords. I don't like this in development, like adding digits, capital letters, special characters. I, I just don't like this in development. Let me show you a practical trick you can apply to avoid this in development, mind you. This options setup is the culprit. What I usually do, what I often do, but not always, is to prepare my own identity configuration. I say often because this step might turn out into a security loophole. So, in sensitive projects, I might advise you not to do this. But if you're just playing around, prepare two kinds of configurations for the identity. One is in development, turn everything off. And the other one is for any other environment that is not development, like production or, or staging or anything. Play serious there. And here comes the idea. They provide a static factory for options and inspect the builder, the, the web application builder. If it is pointing to a development environment, then choose the development configuration, otherwise a non-development one. Configure the options based on the environment and that is all. Let's start the application again. I will have to register once again with a very simple password, a simple word, all small letters. I have just authenticated, I'm in. So this is the skeleton of the application. This is a starting point before we move on into real development. I will show you the future now, the future of this application now, where the development might go. But before that, if you like this video and you want to help me spread the word about my channel and other videos on my YouTube channel, please press the like button, that will help me, thank you. Let's move on. The future begins here. As I said, it takes five minutes to initialize a clean web application project. If you want to edit authentication pages, here they are. If you want to edit the layout, the UI itself, here it is. And so as a backend developer, you get to developing the domain model. Initially, you might place it here. Domain or models, just a namespace is perfectly fine to start off. As time progresses, there will be subdomains to collect groups of classes that are working on one part or the other part of the domain. There will be multiple subdomains. And if you are so lucky that your project is still alive a couple of weeks later, 
then the domain will probably deserve a project of its own, and that will be the new home for all the development of the domain types and classes. The UI is now decoupled from the domain entirely. Again, as the time progresses, some of the subdomains will attain self consciousness. They will become important in their own right. Maybe they will be services deployed separately from everything else. Maybe they will become reusable libraries. Maybe they will turn into a NuGet package you will either use in the team or even deploy publicly. Spin off a new project from that subdomain, keep developing it separately, entirely separately from the rest of the application. And again, the structure of your project will remain clean. So, this is the future. If you like clean architecture, here it is. If you like microservices, here they are. Deploy any part of this in Docker images. This project structure is not stopping you in any of your plans, but it's not forcing you to make any specific steps either. That's why I like this. This project structure is letting you evolve in time without making decisions before they are due, before you know why those decisions are correct. And now that you have the project, you can start watching my other videos. There are plenty of videos how to develop the domain model cleanly and well designed. Enjoy watching those videos. Thank you for staying with me till the very end and see you in the next video.